Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another beautiful Wednesday afternoon. I hope you all have been enjoying your week so far, had a great weekend and all that jazz. Today, we got a little bit of contact work that we're going to go through. I'm going to teach you guys some basics of building your own little basic contact library that you can save on your own, import your own samples, and use for whatever you want. So contact is a very, very useful tool. It is the most popular sampler to date. And while there are new technologies and new software being released, such as the sign player by Orchestral Tools, contact is still considered one of the main sample library softwares for creating virtual libraries, such as orchestral instruments, guitars, bass, drums, anything and everything you can think of. And learning how to use this kind of software, especially the most popular one and the one that's considered mostly readily available, is a great way to improve your options for creativity and a great way to improve your overall productions. So for today, the main focus is going to be how to import your own samples into Contact and how to create your own basic library. Now, making a library inside Contact is not necessarily as difficult as it may seem. It functions the same as any basic sampler that you could find on the market. However, it has a lot of options that you can use that make it a lot more complicated. If you want to use any of these extra options and you want to create a really high-end library, such as those released by Spitfire, Native Instruments, any other sample li library company that you can think of, it does get really difficult to do, and it does take a bit of a background in coding because there's a lot of coding involved, not to mention graphic design to create the interface itself. However, as an indie producer who's just looking to import some samples into a contact instance and make a custom library that you don't really want to share with anyone or that you don't think needs an interface, it's just going to be used to play playback basic samples. You don't need to have a background in coding. You don't need to make your own graphic interface. You just need to have the samples ready and have a little bit of time on your hands. So to start, let's open up an instance of Contact. And for this video, I'll be using Contact 5. The process does not vary for Contact 6. So you can follow along if that's the only version of Contact you have on hand. For Contact 5 and 6, it's going to be exactly the same. So this is just an empty instance of Contact. It doesn't have anything else in it. It's just completely empty. I've shaken out all the optional windows because we're not going to be using really any of those. We might want to have the keyboard up because that'll help us map out the samples later, but it's not necessary to have up. Right now it looks empty and you might be lost at what to do already because it doesn't look like you can build your own instruments. But it's actually quite easy. All you got to do is double click and it will open up this new new contact library. Fresh out of the box, nothing in it. As you can see, it doesn't have an interface, doesn't have a name, doesn't have anything at all. It looks very boring, very basic, but this is where we're going to be starting to build our library. So the first thing I would recommend doing is actually just double clicking up here and naming your library. You can name it whatever you want. For this, we're just gonna do instructional samples. So there we go. It's already named. Great first start. Library is basically built already. Next, we're going to go into this little wrench icon, and this is going to open up sort of the, the groundwork for contact. This takes you where all the work is done. These menus can be accessed on any contact library that has ever been made, whether you made it or if you bought it from a sample library company. If you bought it from a sample library company, there might be a few options in here that have been added in that they've added themselves. However, for the most part, it will look exactly exactly like this. It does look a little bit complicated, but you don't need to worry about most of this because it isn't needed for making a basic library to play back your samples. A lot of this has to do with those optional things that I mentioned earlier. The main things you are going to worry about are this group editor and this mapping editor. So let's open those up. So this is your grouping editor on the top. As you can see right now, it just says group one and it's all pretty empty. This can be thought of as the same as a file browser for your samples once you've imported them, because once you've imported them, you can organize them into groups, which you can then organize by name, velocity, are they round robin samples, anything like that. You can choose to edit all groups at once. You can right click and import groups that you've pre-made, or you can delete any group you want. Now you may be wondering how you make a new group and it's not actually something that you can double click or do or right click and do because it doesn't really say anywhere make new group. 
But before we do that, let's take a look at this mapping editor because this is where a lot of your work is going to be done. The group editor is great for organizing, but the mapping editor is where you actually build the library. So looking at it here, you can see it has a full range piano roll going from C negative two all the way up to C8, much larger range than you'd find on any hardware keyboard on the market as hardware keyboards only go down to C0 around that area and up to about C7, which is right here. So you have options to map things to different ranges if you want. A lot of bigger companies will actually use those extra ranges for things like key switches or articulation changes or to add in some extra live playback options. But you don't have to worry about any of that because you're just making a basic library. So grab whatever samples you want, organize them beforehand. I've already got some samples here. I've got some kick samples from a library I have. And what we're going to do is we're just going to grab one of these kick samples and we're going to drag it in. For now, let's just put it right on C3. I don't want it to be triggered on any other note. I just want it to be played using C3. We've just dragged the sample in and you can already hear it playing back. And as you saw, this group one up here turns a yellow orange when that sample is triggered. That means that that sample was actually automatically put into the first group. So it was organized for us. That'll happen with the first sample you put in. That's not to worry. But what if I want to bring in more samples? Well, it's the exact same thing. I'm going to grab this other sample and I'm going to drag it in. I'm going to map it to D. Now I have two samples loaded in, ready to go. As you can see, this really isn't that complicated when you get down to it. But there are a couple options that you can play with, even in the most basic settings of contact. So you can actually extend the range at which the samples are played back, and it'll actually tell you the range that the sample will be triggered on in the top left here. So right now, any note between D3 and B5 triggered this sample. As you can see, it also automatically pitches it for you based on where it was extended from. We still get our basic sound when we play the original that we mapped it to, which was D. But if we go up, we get some interesting notes as it pitches it. This can be done with any note anywhere you map it, and you can even have overlap. So now it's playing two notes at the same time, and it is automatically pitching it for you, which is something you will want to keep in mind if you're making a library that contains a lot of tonal sound. Like if you're making an actual instrument library, you will want to make sure that any notes that you drag in, you have them clearly labeled. Organization is important. If it's going to a specific note, make sure it goes to that specific note. You can also set them to trigger at different velocities. So for example, say I loaded in two more kick sample instruments, but I want them to play on the same notes, but I want them to play on hard velocities only, while these original ones I want to play on softer velocities. What we're going to do is we're going to select these and we're just going to bring them down. Let's bring them down to about 60 each. Once they're there, let's import our other two kick samples. I've got them set off on the side here, so let's just drag them in. Now, because I want to keep things organized, I'm actually going to click on the top right here first, create an empty group. And I'm just going to label this group hard velocities. If you're making a library, you can label your groups whatever you want. And this first group, I'm going to label as soft velocities. Now we have our two different groups very clearly organized. So let's select the second group and let's drag in our samples. Now what we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to map them to the exact same notes that we have our original two map to. But we're going to change this first velocity value to 60 where the other ones ended. And you already have it set up so that you have different samples triggering on different velocities. For example, low velocity will play our original samples. And harder velocities will play our new samples. Already you have a very basic, very functional library, and you can do this with any samples you want for any genre you want, any instrument. And here's a secret that a lot of post-production guys out there would be interested to know. So contact instruments are generally known for instruments. They're generally known for musical samples that can be used to make songs, compositions, cues, EDM, really anything and everything out there but it still functions the same as a basic sampler. And what a lot of post-production guys will actually do is they'll import post-production samples into this and use contact to play back those samples when they're cutting. A great example of this is footsteps. So let's delete what we have. 
go back to a basic empty contact instance and let's see how this is done. So for the same purpose, I've set aside some footstep samples and I'm just gonna go ahead and drag those in. We have three footstep samples we can play with and they sound very basic, just walking on concrete. And what we can actually do is if we're cutting to a video and there's a lot of footsteps and we don't want to necessarily go in and cut them all by hand and we want to save some time for the client, which would save you money, save them money, you can open up a pre-made contact instance of footsteps that you've already made and saved and use it to play back the footsteps you're seeing on the screen. So for example, character A is walking down a concrete tunnel by themselves. Now that you've already keyed it in, you've recorded all that media in as you're watching and playing back very carefully, just like a Foley artist, all you have to do is go in, line up the MIDI, tighten it up a little bit because you won't be able to play it in exactly on the frame and then bounce it down to audio and boom, you've already cut a full track of footsteps for a character. It's really that simple. And say you're building one of these footsteps libraries for the first time and you wanna save it, well, Simple, we're just gonna label it footsteps one or whatever you would like. And you go up to here, you hit save. It's gonna ask you where to save the NKI file and you can save it to wherever you want. If you're making an instrument library or you're making a sample library in contact and you're doing something like this, I recommend using sort of the same structure that a lot of the big companies use where you have everything in one folder that has subfolders in it. So if you're making a contact library for footsteps, import all the footsteps you're gonna use into their own folder uh, inside the main folder where you're gonna keep everything and just label it as samples. And once you have that, don't touch it, leave it in there. And whenever you have to move anything around, move that whole master folder. And then what you can do is you can save this NKI file as an instruments file inside that master folder. And that way it will always be able to find the instrument samples in the same location every time. You'll be able to load it up with no problems and you'll be able to create as many libraries as you want. For example, let's say we just imported our files again and we wanna save it, we're done, we've done everything we want, we've organized all of our groups, we've got our samples laid out by velocity, we have our footsteps organized so that soft footsteps play at soft velocities and louder like running steps play at higher velocities. Or let's say you made like a bass guitar library, you've imported all the notes and samples in, everything's organized, you have round robin set up, everything's perfect, you wanna save it. Like I said, all you gotta do is save, find the file folder that you save everything into, I made this one here called test instrument files and I've already organized all the samples I'm using into this samples folder. And I'm just gonna select this folder and save this NKI. Now, when I open this folder here, it does automatically import all the samples into its own custom folder for you that it will generate when you save it. However, I still find it good practice to have them here just in case. And as you can see, the NKI is right here. Now, let's go back, let's delete this. And now let's say we're cutting a video. We want to pull up that bass guitar we made, or we want to pull up that collection of footsteps or Foley sounds. Just grab the NKI file, which is right here, and we're gonna drag that into contact. As we can see, all of our samples are still in it. And when I play them back, everything plays back. You don't need a big experience in coding. You don't need a very complex or nice looking interface to make something like this and use on your own. This is how a lot of independent producers will create their own libraries and create their own sounds and organize them for playback. And as I said, a lot of post-production engineers use this same method for cutting sounds to film. You don't have to limit yourself to a certain collection of samples or sounds. You can use anything and everything. You could use drums, you could use slaps, you could use screams and yelling. You could use you breaking your brand new instruments on the driveway for all I care. You can use it for whatever you want. That's what it is to be creative. But I hope you guys found this useful and informative as always. If you have any more questions about how to just get this set up in a basic way, leave those questions in the comments below and I would be more than happy to make another video in the future covering this topic and maybe how to make something a little more complicated. And I will see you guys on Friday for that album release live stream that we're gonna do. I hope you guys come and hang out for a little bit. We're probably gonna be doing it around 5, 5.30 Pacific Standard Time. And I'm just gonna be there to answer your questions, do whatever you guys wanna do, talk about the music, talk music, anything and everything. So I'll see you guys Friday. And if not Friday, I'll see you next Wednesday for our next video. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy your week. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.